Records are vital uh, to protect you as a support worker and to ensure that your patient's care has continuity. Records are defined very A health record is defined under the Data Protection Act as any electronic or paper information recorded about a person for the purpose of managing their health care. This is very broad. Health records therefore include a variety of patient records that are held or filed within a hospital or clinic. They include the nursing record, the doctor's medical record, x-rays, pathology reports, outpatient reports, pharmacy records and many others. Together they form a record of the care and treatment a patient has received. Records are usually created for their clinical purpose, to show what care and treatment a patient has, had and should have through their care plan. But from a legal point of view, records provide evidence of your involvement with that patient. So they need to be sufficiently detailed to show that you have discharged your duty of care to your patient. In Saunders and Leeds Western Health Authority, a four-year-old boy had to go for surgery uh, to explore a problem with his knee. According to the theatre team, suddenly, without explanation, the boy's heart stopped. He suffered brain damage as a result and sued the hospital. At trial, the court looked at the records and there were very few records at all monitoring that recorded the monitoring of his vital signs. The court held that the theatre team simply hadn't been monitoring him properly and hadn't seen signs that he was in distress which resulted in his heart stopping. He was awarded £1.85 million against the health authority. I would recommend to you five principles of good record keeping. You have to make sure that records are factual, that they're truthful and based on a foundation of fact. You have to ensure that they're accurate, that what's being recorded is clear and ambiguous, dated, timed and signed, that they're consistent, that they can be shown to be reliable and dependable, and that they're timely, that they've been recorded in a contemporaneous way, that is, at the time of or as soon as possible after the incident occurred. They also need to be shared. They need to be communicated with other members of the clinical team. What you write in your record does matter. It's not a mechanistic process. When people sue or complain, the outcome isn't based on truth, but on proof. What can you prove happened? If it's not in the notes, it can be very difficult to prove that you carried out your duties and cases are won and lost on the strength of those records. Legal and professional principles also dictate that the care provider with personal knowledge should be the person who documents care and the practice of documenting for other care providers can lead to errors and inaccuracies. That can lead to inadmissibility of the records in court proceedings and complaints investigations, and they diminish the actual weight or credit given to the record. You're also discouraged from co-signing entries made by other care providers, unless there's a policy in the organization that clearly indicates the intent of a co-signature. Records need to build a picture of why the patient is receiving care and treatment and what assessments, observations and treatment have been carried out. Records need to be sufficiently detailed to show you've discharged your duty of care. The backbone of this is an evidence-based care plan and thorough progress reports. In one case, a man called Mr. Marriott had been out drinking of an evening. He climbed his stairs to bed but slipped on the top step, falling backwards, putting his head through a partition wall at the bottom of the stairs. He went off to hospital and was kept in overnight, but much to his wife's surprise, was discharged next day, 
still feeling very drowsy, groggy and nauseous. This didn't improve through the weekend uh, and so she rung the hospital who said that if she was still concerned by the end of the week to phone the doctor. There was no improvement come the Thursday and so she rung her GP who came to see her husband. The GP said that he'd carried out a full neurological examination on Mr Marriott but sadly that evening he suffered an extradural bleed which left him paralysed and he sued the GP. When the case came to trial some six years later, there was very little detail in the record other than that the GP had said he'd carried out a full neurological examination. Because so much time had passed, the GP couldn't recall exactly what that examination consisted of. But the husband and wife, Mr and Mrs Marriott, remembered it as if it was yesterday. They said that Mr Marriott was asked to name the Queen, to name the Prime Minister and to stand up, close his eyes and touch the end of his finger on the end of his nose. The court held that the only sensible thing that the doctor could have done in those circumstances after nearly a week of being at home was to send Mr Marriott back to the hospital for a scan. Had that happened, they said, they might have discovered the bleed in time to prevent paralysis. In Marriott, an incomplete record was fatal to the case. Details of the examination were missing, but equally damning was the lack of evidence as to why the doctor had decided to wait and see. Decisions about care must include why you decide to wait and see. These are very common decisions in healthcare and must be recorded. Other details must include details of any assessments and reviews that have been undertaken, evidence of the arrangements you have made for future or ongoing care, including where you decide to wait and see, and information that you've given about the care and treatment of a patient uh, to their carer. Decisions about care and treatment are often made on a multidisciplinary or interagency basis. Your record should include the background to any discussion and its outcome. You should indicate the reason for the decision and corroborate the account of other team members, building a wall of evidence to protect you. You also have to corroborate other legal requirements or, or any form completed by the patient in your presence. You must include details of telephone calls made, even if they go unanswered to the patient or to others about the patient and record discussions arising from them with the date, time uh, and include referrals to specialist practitioners. Any telephone calls to other agencies where you have a concern that there's a risk should be followed up in writing. Health professionals argue at times that they're too busy to write re records or that their ability to complete a record has been delayed. They often argue the pressure of work has delayed the record entry or so drained the available resources in staff terms that the standard of care was lowered. You have to remember that the court can look at the records of other patients to, on that day to, to corroborate this, to see how busy people were. In Deacon and McVicar, a woman complained that she and her child were harmed as a result of a mismanaged labour. The staff in the maternity unit argued that this was a singularly eventful night with many, many emergencies. They'd had more staff, but were still overwhelmed. The judge ordered disclosure of the records of the other mothers and babes in the unit that evening. And they, they also corroborated just how busy an evening, how singularly eventful that evening was. And the judge had said, that the team could have done no better with the resources they had and were not negligent. Records must clearly identify the patient. They must be written in a way that identifies the patient throughout the document with a name, record number, address on every page of the record. Records must also include the views and observation of the person and their family members in relation to the assessment of the person's physical, psychological and social well-being. The planning and provision of care which demonstrates that it was discussed
discussed and understood by the person and their family when appropriate, and the identification of next of kin and the agreed family member to whom information for other family members is provided. The record must demonstrate the continuity of care and that this is person-centred and that the person's family or carer is supported and included in the decisions about care and treatment. So it's essential that the views and comments of the person, his family, regarding any aspect of care are put into quotation marks so they can be easily identified and distinguished from your written entries. Records must be legible. It's essential that records, instructions, prescriptions or referrals for treatment be written legibly and indelibly. They're a key communication tool between health professionals. They allow for continuity of care, so it's essential that they can be read. That begins with the clarity of entry that requires ink that contrasts with the paper being used. For white paper, use black ink. In litigation or investigations, a record will be copied many times to each of the relevant parties. So it's essential that they photocopy well and can still be read. Beware if you use thermal paper for faxes or other diagnostic instruments because they often fade after time. Writing indelibly with indelible ink or typeface is essential for two reasons. Records must stand the test of time. It may be many years, on average six years, before they're referred to again, and a faded record is of little value as evidence. The credibility of your record as evidence is also enhanced by it being made at the time of the incident. An indelible ink or typeface reassures the court that the entry hasn't been subsequently altered in any way. Records must be accurate and clear. There's great temptation to use jargon and abbreviations as a form of professional shorthand. This risks miscommunication uh, because we are using shorthand that not everybody understands. A combination of shorthand instructions and poor handwriting led to the death of a patient when the patient visited his GP with the results of his blood coagulation blood test. The doctor wrote same in a card and told him to give it to the receptionist who would give him a repeat prescription. The receptionist misread the S of same as five and the rest of the word is MGS and issued him with a prescription for five milligrams of warfarin instead of the one milligram that he was used to taking. Three weeks later, the man was found dead from a massive hemorrhage. Jargon is also used to convey offensive remarks. So although you're under considerable work pressure, don't use abbreviations or jargon. The risks are too great and misinterpretation by staff and patients is common. In one instance, a nurse uh, from the emergency department was sent to the medical decisions unit to work for the day. When he received a phone call from a patient's wife inquiring about him, he saw DOA on the patient's notes and told his wife that the patient was dead on arrival at the hospital. This was the meaning of the acronym in A&E where he usually worked, but on the war DOA simply meant date of admission. The man was ill but alive, sitting up in bed, drinking soup at the time. Cryptic acronyms can be very offensive. Examples include CLL or chronic lowlife, FLK for funny looking kid, often explained by JLD or just like dad. Have a look at the graphic on this page for some of the other commonly used cryptic offensive abbreviations used and recorded in medical notes. Evidentially, the first impression a court or an investigation has of you is from your notes. So cryptic comments have no place in records. If records are not professional, then the assumption is neither is care and your credibility as a witness is greatly diminished. To be credible, records have to be accurate. Records must show the point in time that the entry was made. 
So to confirm the chronology of record entries, each entry must be identified with the date, that's the day, month and year, and the time using a 24 hour clock. Records must also indicate the author of the entry. So you must sign your records with your name printed legibly underneath the signature together with your position. Do not use initials for entries as it's vital that we can identify the member of staff if a complaint is made and a witness is sought. Sometimes we do make mistakes in record entries and have to make an alteration. You should never delete a record entry. You mustn't score out so as to make that entry illegible. All alterations must be made by scoring out with a single line that doesn't completely obscure the error and correcting fluid must not be used. Records need to be timely or contemporaneous. They need to be written at the time of or as soon as possible after the events to which they relate. Contemporaneous recording is vital as it adds to the reliability of the record entry and means that with the leave of the court you can refer to the record when giving evidence. The contemporaneous altering of a record contributed to a finding of negligence in a case called Kent and Griffiths and others where an emergency ambulance took some 30 minutes to arrive at an address, but the crew recorded that the duration of the journey was just nine minutes. The judge held that the record had been contemporaneously falsified and found for the patient. Records need to be complete. All sections of the record must be completed. If a section isn't relevant, say so. If the patient's condition remains the same, say so. Be careful of writing unthoughtful, arbitrary, ambiguous entries. In one case, a record entry said 6.30 a.m., sleeping peacefully, 8.40 dead. In the cold light of a courtroom, such an entry makes it look like the patient was not being monitored properly. Remember to complete the allergy documentation, uh, including where the situation is that the patient has no known allergies. So do not write inaccurate or incomplete entries. Don't completely obscure a record entry. Don't pull out or remove pages. Numbered pages are best because we can highlight where a page is missing. Don't leave blank spaces. Draw a line across any blank space to avoid any unintended additions being made to the original. Don't overwrite entries. Use don't use pencil or non-permanent ink or typeface. Don't write in the margins. These are only for the time and date uh, and signature. They're not for doodles or text language. A doctor who injected thousands of children in his practice without the date MMR vaccines, then fake blood test results was struck off by the General Medical Council and later jailed for nine months after pleading guilty to nine counts of forgery. And a practice nurse was struck off for a whole catalogue of poor record keeping. She recorded pneumopoly in a patient's notes when she should have recorded pneumococcal conjugate, didn't record the two parts of the pedicel injection, namely pertussis and hib, had been administered to a patient, recorded she'd advised a patient in the notes instead of that she'd given uh, a pneumococcal booster vaccination, didn't record that she discussed the required yellow fever vaccination with a patient traveling to Peru, and didn't document the administration of hepatitis B and typhoid to a patient on the computer system. And whilst giving a vaccination to a child patient at home, didn't explain to the patient's mother which vaccination she was giving, wiped blood away from the leg with a finger instead of a swab of cotton wool, and then licked the spot of blood away with her tongue. We recommend that you subject your record entries to a five minute appraisal from a colleague or a manager, better them than a judge, to try and highlight the three common errors that often occur in record entries. The first is incomplete tasking. Is the entry complete? Have you shown that you've discharged your duty of care? Very often you only describe half of what you did. 
consent taken, vaccination given, risks explained. You also need to make sure that your record entry is based on a foundation of fact. So whenever an opinion is expressed, it should have a factual basis. So you need to be able to recognise what is a fact and what is a supposition. The statements, the child is immature, the child understands the treatment, the child uses abusive language, are all opinion or supposition where the facts are not present to support them. And finally, communication. Failure of communication underpins complaints and litigation. So will your record entry be clearly understood by those who read it? You may have to expand certain entries so that everyone understands what you mean and you must avoid abbreviations. So remember, what you write does matter. Records are never neutral. They will either support you or condemn you. So take great care when writing your records.